What's happening, y'all? Welcome inside the Fantasy Stock Exchange. Danny and Bush coming at you basically with some tips for how to play Dynasty Fantasy Football for those of you guys that might be intermediate players. Now, we have a couple videos on our channel we did last year. If you guys want to check them out, they'll be linked in the description of the basics of Dynasty, you know, understanding the value of rookie picks and stuff. We're going to get into a little bit more of the weeds in this video, talk about some tips that we've learned over the past couple of years playing Dynasty Fantasy Football. Maybe you guys played in your first Dynasty League this year and it didn't go so well. Maybe you're looking to turn things around. Maybe you haven't joined a Dynasty League yet, but you've been playing Redraft for a number of years and you want to know some lessons basically that you can take away from us as experienced Dynasty players so that you don't make the same mistakes that we made to learn these lessons. And I know a lot of these lessons I learned the fastest because I made a mistake on them. So um, basically that's what we're going to be talking about in today's video. Again, uh, more of a macro game theory type of video, not necessarily play or replay or analysis. Like this video if you enjoy, comment any of your thoughts down below, and subscribe to the channel if you are new. But Danny, how are you doing today? Doing well, doing well. And yeah, the biggest misconception that a lot of experienced redraft players have is that they're just going to head into a dynasty league. They're going to run ship like they do in their redraft leagues, and they're going to win every single championship. Well, let me tell you right now, if you make mistakes early on in your dynasty league, you're going to be spending your whole uh, dynasty experience trying to make up for those mistakes. And to, to be honest with you, eliminating those right off the get-go is how you get a competitive advantage on the rest of your league mates. Particularly, again, of course, if you're in a, a new league with guys that you have experience with in redraft, learning the basic dynamics of how to play Dynasty Fantasy Football is going to get you way more profitable right away. So I'm excited. I'm ready to roll. Again, we're going to be going over our top six tips, going in alternating order. If you guys like content like this, as always, make sure you leave a like down below. But before we get into the first tip, as always, we're going to hit the intro. All right, so we're going to start off with the first tip, the number number one tip for Dynasty Football if you're going to be starting as an intermediate, you know, redraft type of player. Don't undervalue your rookie picks. The biggest thing that I see these new redraft players embarking in Dynasty doing is, oh, you know, my 2023 first, it's two years out. That pick, that player isn't going to help me right now. I don't need that. Wrong. Wrong. Rookie picks are the lifeblood of Dynasty Fantasy Football. And what separates it from redraft is the incoming rookies you have in each and every single year. The problem that I said with rookie picks is, in my, in my experience, is their current rate when they go at the startup. A lot of people mostly undervalue their rookie picks at their startup and start realizing and regretting them trading so cheap after their startup. So again, if you have that type of asset that is always going to be inherently cheaper at the startup and increase in value post-startup, it's typically a good asset to invest in, which is, as I'll get into, one of my things in investing in liquid assets. Rookie picks will always be the best liquid asset in Dynasty. And yet, they, again, as I mentioned, they're often thrown around during startups when a drafter eyes a player that they need to move up for. They need their, you know, Ryan Tannehill. They need their, you know, Justin Fields. They, 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 they need their Dalvin Cook. They need to have that player on their team and are willing to move these rookie picks because they're non- uh, point producers year one. But if you decide to trade up during your startup, you have to make sure the bait is worth the hook that's going to come with it. And if you guys, obviously, if you, if you guys fish, you would know that a lot of fishes are going to bite on good bait. You have to make sure that the bait that you're biting on is well worth the hook in your mouth. Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't disagree. I think the biggest thing with rookie picks too, that I see people doing is they equate rookie picks to players. And that's always a huge mistake, right? Because we can say the 2023 draft class, and we say this all the time, it could be B. John Robinson. It could be, you know, Tank Bigsby. It could be this player, that player, the other player. But the reality of the situation is, if I told you right now that I had a stock pick or Bitcoin or whatever, like you like to invest in, and I told you it was going to go up in value 10 to 50%, depending on how the strength of that draft class, would you invest in it? Like, obviously, right? It's going to go up in value no matter what. There is zero downside risk. Because no matter how bad a class is perceived to be, there's still going to be rookie fever. There's still going to be an NFL combine, assuming you know COVID goes away sometime soon. And there's still going to be buzz generated around those players, regardless of if they're worthy of that buzz or not. And that's how you can capitalize on the value of rookie picks. Because again, like Danny said, this is a liquid asset. This is not a player that you're trading away. So if you're a redraft player and somebody's like, 
oh yeah, you know, trade away a 2023 first for, you know, Julio Jones. You, you like you need uh you need all the help you can get to help you win a championship this year. That first is a year from now, two years from now. It doesn't matter. That's not really how it works because that pick uh come the 2023 rookie draft season, it's going to be worth a shit ton more than whatever veteran wide receiver that you got for him. So that's basically how you want to value rookie picks. You want to take into account the accumulating value that they're going to have because they will not go down in value. Rookie picks cannot get injured. They cannot, you know, blow their knee out. They cannot, you know, um, get in trouble off the field. There is nothing that they can do to lose value. Yep. No, and I'm I'm glad you mentioned that because understanding your relative value and how the market will operate will get you in that advantage. Just saying, for example, uh, there's experienced fantasy analysts in the industry that still don't know how the dynasty market works. I mean, there are constant tweets throughout the season. Oh, if you only have to get Allen Robinson for a 2023 first, you do that now. And you know damn well what tweet I'm exactly referring to when I say that. There are still fancy analysts. So again, don't get discouraged if you don't yet know how to play dynasty. Take this video, learn from it. And the one thing that I want to say of this tip, don't undervalue your rookie picks. On the flip side, if you're in a startup, and you're heading into, you know, a year two, year three, year four type of contention window, your startup's going to be the cheapest way to get your rookie picks. Your startup's going to be the cheapest way to, you know, build on these classes, five, six, seven rookie picks, you name it, because there's always going to be fever when people see a player they want on the clock. Yeah, especially in, in startups specifically, second rounders are, are nothing. People don't care about second rounders. Oh, I'm not giving up my first. Like, I will give you a second rounder to move up these four picks in the, in the dynasty startup in the middle of the 10th round. Like, realistically... How much better is the player you're getting than the the pick that you're giving up? And that second rounder is going to be valuable, whether it's in this class, next year's class, whatever the case is. So yeah, don't undervalue rookie picks. It is the number one tip that I have learned from Dynasty because again, we've made these mistakes. We've gone into startups as redraft players and sold our first round pick and been like, you know what? I probably shouldn't have done that a couple months later and looked at the class ahead and we're like, this this class is getting a whole lot of buzz. I remember my first Dynasty League, I sold my 2020 uh, first. And that pick ended up being Cam Akers. Yeah. And I was pissed. Yeah, no, I I, I could just imagine. Uh, It's funny because whenever people trade their picks, they're automatically assuming that they're going to be late. Your inherent bias on your own team is ultimately going to drive down the value of your own assets. Genuinely. If people are trading up, again, if there's one person consistently trading down two rounds, three rounds, whatever, picking up first, picking up seconds, as you mentioned, to move down a few picks. Everybody that they're trading with is assuming that pick's going to be the 112 because they're like, ah, you know, it's worth losing this pick because I'm going to win the championship. If you do that multiple times and you're the seller of those picks when you're in your startup draft, you're going to make, make a heck of the fortune, a heck of a fortune in the long run. Yeah, because half of those picks will end up being the 105 too instead yeah. of uh, the 112 like they thought. So yeah, that's the, the the spiel on rookie picks. Again, I think it is probably the number one most important thing to take into account if you are, maybe you've never played in a dynasty league and you're transitioning from redraft or this is your first year in a dynasty league and you, it didn't go so well and you want to learn from it. So number two, and this one is very obvious, but it is the hardest thing to actually do in dynasty because this is the true way to get ahead in dynasty. Invest in good players. Again, I know it sounds simple. I know that it is the easiest thing that you should be able to do is spot talent and invest in those players. But fantasy football at its core is all about drafting good players. Back in the 70s, the 80s, when fantasy football was first invented, they just looked at who are the best players in the league. I'm going to draft them. Obviously, we know that there's a lot more that goes into it than that now. But the hard part becomes thinking everyone is equally elite or has this elite upside when the reality is, is that there is a top 1% in the NFL. In the top 1%, of athletes that the NFL already is. There's only like 1,500 players in the NFL that are all elite athletes. There's still an elite tier of players. And you guys know who I'm talking about. You know it's the Jamar Chases, the Jonathan Taylors, Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes, these elite tier of assets. Thinking that everybody is talented and everybody has this elite ceiling is the wrong way to think about it, right? We need to know that there is a bigger gap between stable assets like Jonathan Taylor, like Jamar Chase, like Josh Allen, all these like elite guys and the and uh, the non-stable assets, the guys that are breakout candidates or you know older players that have produced in the past. The reason that the NFL has been called the not for long league uh, in the past is because w- we can see it in Dynasty ADP. Thankfully, we have resources like DLF who show us previous year's ADP, and we can see how much has changed in two years. This data was taken from January 2020, right? So not very long ago. A lot of these uh, pieces are still valuable today, 
but not to the same extent that they were in the past, right? Saquon Barkley was the undisputed 101 that year. And Saquon Barkley is now being had in the third, fourth, fifth round because of a number of injuries. We also see the further you go down this, we see some guys that might not be even really relevant in the first eight to 10 rounds of dynasty startups now, like Odell Beckham Jr., for example, Mm -hmm. like Carson Wentz, like you know, Baker Mayfield, some of these guys that were thought of to be the next great dynasty assets. This was only two short years ago. The value of some of these players has dropped tremendously. And again, the takeaway from this for me is the truly stable assets, the Jamar Chases, the Justin Jeffersons, the Patrick Mahomes, Josh Allen, Jonathan Taylor. These guys should be very hard to acquire when you go out and trade for them. Or if you drafted them, somebody's like, oh yeah, you know, I'll give you, you know, um, Chris Godwin in a second rounder for, for Justin Jefferson. Like that should not be enough for you to move off of, you know, a guy like Justin Jefferson, because the reality is we don't know everything. We don't know who's going to hold value. We don't know who's going to remain an elite talent, but the closer you get to knowing that the less likely you should be to get rid of an asset like that. So we don't know everything about Justin Jefferson. He could, you know, go out and tear his ACL week one next year, but he's the closest thing that we know to an elite 10 year dynasty asset at the wide receiver position. Yeah, no, I again, I fully agree with that sentiment that elite players will always carry weight and will always have value on the market in terms of being an appreciating asset, a steady asset, a liquid asset to be able to hold on to. This also most definitely applies in your rookie draft. Again, it does apply in your startup draft as well, but the thing I find most is people always focus in the startup draft for the most part. Like if you're an experienced player, oh yeah, you know what? I can accumulate talent. I want to accumulate talent. I want to accumulate talent. Whereas for some reason, they go into their rookie drafts and then take Trey Sermon in the first round when a guy like Elijah Moore was on the board, when a guy like Rashad Bateman was on the board, when a guy like Mac Jones was on the board, they go with need rather than overall talent. And you would have seen some instances of Jamar Chase, you know, following to the 106, 107, 108 in some of your rookie drafts. Hey, in one of our rookie drafts we're in together, the 108 and 109 back to back were Jamar Chase and Kyle Pitts. So uh, if that doesn't tell you something, it is. Take the best players regardless of position. Do not just focus on filling out your needs. I got to fill out a lineup. The the thing that I notice most is people are so focused on filling out a lineup rather than accumulating this value. And I'm I'm glad I mentioned that too because that actually goes right into my next point in that understanding post-draft trade value is the most important thing you have to consider when making your decision when on the clock. Again, contextualize your value post-draft. What are your most appealing assets, not just players? And when you're on the clock, determine what can net you the greatest trade appeal. If you're on the clock and you're facing, you know, Stefan Diggs or T Higgins, think of this. Is the year one production of Stefan Diggs worth the loss of value for a soon to be 29 year old wide receiver? Or would, you know, a 23 year old T Higgins be the uh, optimal choice at that spot? We personally, we would go with the T Higgins. We've seen he was a top 12 producer this year. We've seen he's tied to Joe Burrow. We'll see he's still only uh, born in 1999. That is the type of asset you want to invest in and hold on to because no matter what happens, he, he, as you're going to point out later, it's hard for them to lose value. So overall, analyze when you are on the clock, what are the most stable assets available to you? Not just the ones that will produce the most year one. And separate your mind from a redraft perspective to a market perspective. View these players as tangible assets in Dynasty rather than year-to-year point producers. Once you're able to do that, you can fully grasp the concept of what exactly Dynasty fantasy football is. Right. And that'll obviously come with whether you're rebuilding or contending, the more so that you have to do that. Because when you are rebuilding, you do think of them more as assets than you would if you're contending when it's, it is more about on-field production because you're trying to win. But at the same time, you always want to be thinking from that frame of mind, because like Danny just said, the year one production of Stefan Diggs, like, is it going to shock anybody next year? If T Higgins outproduces Stefan Diggs in fantasy, in, in redraft, not in, in dynasty, just in redraft, Will T. Higgins outproduce Stephon Diggs? I would say it's it's unlikely. He's probably not going to, but it is possible. So at that point, why are we going to take Stephon Diggs uh, ahead of him in you know in a dynasty draft? When again, post draft, to your point, can you trade right after your startup? The guy, let's say one guy took Stephon Diggs, I take Stephon Diggs, you take T. Higgins. Can I call you up after the draft and say I want T. Higgins? Are you going to give me him for Stephon Diggs? Probably not, right? So why is he actually valued higher or similarly? in the the startup draft when we know that you can't actually trade those players one for one. So that is an inconsistency. And I would say the the position that most applies to is running back 
because with running backs, especially their window is smaller than wide receivers. I think in a wide receivers case, it is a little bit more likely that they produce late into their, you know, late twenties, early thirties. But if I take a Dalvin cook on my, on my uh, draft board ahead of JK Dobbins, am I going to turn around right after my startup, go to the JK Dobbins owner and be like, Hey, I'll give you Dalvin cook straight up. Is he going to tell me get the fuck out of here? Or is he going to, to make that trade? Because if he says, get the fuck out of here, then why the hell did I draft Dalvin cook ahead of JK Dobbins? Yeah, and again, that's going to segue into a, a later point that I have in terms of really the running back position as a whole and their fragility in dynasty fantasy football. But yeah, I mean, at the end of the day here, you want to build a team based off the highest appeal assets. And then once you are ready to go into win now, be able to flip your better assets into more win now pieces. Or heck, if you're lucky, maybe T Higgins ends up developing into a Stefan Diggs level player and still has the value of a, you know, 24, 25 year old as opposed to a 29 year old. So at the end of the day here, there's so much ceiling that you can attain by taking the younger, more fluid, more flexible assets. Right. And I think the, the best case scenario, the scenario that everyone wants to find themselves in is their elite difference making players are draft and developed on their team or traded for whatever the case is. And the pieces, the, the RB two production, the wide receiver three production that supplement a championship roster were traded for, or were, you know, acquired for cheap. Like let's say uh, this season in week four, you traded a third I'll, rounder I'll for Patterson or something like that. Right. You don't want to have to rely on your pieces to develop into wide receiver threes. You want your, your foundational pieces to develop into the studs on your roster, the Jefferson's, you know, the digs, the, the Mahomes, the Allens, like the, that you want to be the foundation of your roster and supplement pro, uh, cheap production where you can with Melvin Gordon's and Cordero Patterson's and, you know, those type of players that you can go out and acquire. Yep. No, I fully agree. And I, heck, I'm going to get into that exactly uh, in tip five, but either way we can segue. What is your fourth tip for intermediate fantasy players or new coming dynasty fantasy football players? Right. And again, this kind of does go with what we were just talking about. And this one is the number one biggest mistake I think I see people make both in redraft and in dynasty. It's understanding your downside risk, range of outcomes, whatever you want to call it versus upside. Because I think there's a scenario that you can paint. If you look through the top 50 players in dynasty ADP right now, there's probably a scenario where you can paint them being uh, the 101 next year or like a top 10 pick in dynasty next year. The tough thing to do is look at how do these guys fail, right? How are they, if they get injured, if they don't break out, if they're a potential breakout candidate, if they're an aging player, something like that, you need to understand what your downside risk is because your downside risk is often minimized for certain players. And that's what you need to take into account during your draft. So I'm going to use JK Dobbins and Dalvin Cook as an example again, because JK Dobbins tore his ACL before the season, right? That was part of his downside risk because he plays running back. He could get injured, but how much has J.K. Dobbins' dynasty ADP suffered relative to if Dalvin Cook tore his ACL before this season? Or, you know, some of the aging players that we've seen, Allen Robinson had a down season from a production standpoint. How much has his value gone down? How much has DeAndre Hopkins' value gone down because he dealt with injuries this year? How much has Saquon Barkley's uh, value gone down because he dealt with injuries yet again this year? This also applies for investing in unproven breakout candidates too, because the biggest, um, I think, hive of dynasty Twitter and people that are, you know, uh, up with fantasy football is investing and in trying to spot the next, you know, T Higgins, the next whatever breakout candidate you want to call them, because the buzz of those players will be reflected in ADP. You cannot get a discount on Gabriel Davis right now because he just had a four touchdown, 200 yard game in a divisional playoff game with the Buffalo Bills. He is the hottest name in fantasy football right now because of that reason. And for that reason, he's either going to go too high in, in dynasty ADP relative to the production he gives you for the rest of his career, Most or likely. he's going to go too low. So understanding what your downside risk is, whether it's investing in aging players like Dalvin Cook, investing in potential breakout candidates like Gabriel Davis. And it also kind of goes back to drafting and trading for players that we know are talented as well. Because if you drafted Brian Edwards in the ninth through 10th round this year, before your dynasty startup, before the 2021 season, you're probably regretting that pick because we know now that Brian Edwards maybe isn't as good as some people thought he was, or Jalen Rager, or again, Gabriel Davis, who's a very hot topic right now. You need to understand that downside risk because certain players can go from being a dynasty breakout candidate one year to you know potentially they're fighting for the, their career the next year. Yeah, no, again, I fully agree with this. Um, when you're looking at what exactly is uh, really evaluating your, evaluating your downside risk versus your upside is based on market expectations. 
Is the market already anticipating them at closer to their ceiling projection or closer to their floor projection? For example, we talked about our dynasty buy low, buys, uh, buy low and sell high video. You guys would have already seen that by now. If not, make sure to watch that after this video. The guys that we mentioned are buy low are guys that we genuinely think that the market is soured out on and closer to their floor projection, which therefore makes them buy. It makes them buy because again, if we're using a median range of outcomes here, their median range of outcomes is already higher than their inherent value. Flip side, sell highs. For example, a guy like Amon or St. Brown, people are already putting into the top 20 of wide receiver ADP. Realistically, if he were to go out next year with new target competition and he had a wide receiver 30 type of season, his value would plummet. His value would go down inherently because people would realize maybe this isn't the wide receiver one I expected to pick up. Maybe this is more so a low, low end wide receiver two, high end wide receiver three, which isn't a bad production ceiling, but not with what we expected. So understanding those range of outcomes and where the market is at on them is how you get that edge in being able to trade players when they're at their peaks and sell players when they're at their floors or sorry, vice versa. You know what I mean? Yeah. I know what you mean. And yeah. Josh Jacobs comes to mind as a guy that has kind of been victim to that, right? Because a couple of years ago in that 2020 ADP, he was expected to be the next great running back, right? He was expected to be the next, you know, uh, Nick Chubb or whatever, whatever running back you want to compare him to. And it's not like he's been bad. He's been a guy that's finished as like a top 15 running back in redraft and year over year for the last couple of years, but the expectation was higher. So his value has plummeted as a result of that. And that comes again with downside risk. How much is his value plummeted? Not as much as if he was 29 years old, but it has still plummeted relative to his expectations because he was one of those breakout candidates. So I'll let you get into uh, your final tip and then I'll get into my final tip and we'll head out of here. Yeah, for sure. And uh, this also goes into basically everything I've been saying, basically everything you've been saying and investing in liquid assets. Well, let's talk about it from a positional standpoint, building your team around your quarterbacks and wide receivers and acquiring your running backs once you're ready to compete. Going all in on second contract running backs forces you into going full win now and accepting that most likely your highest selected players are going to be depreciating values. Again, you mentioned guys like Dalvin Cook, guys like if Alvin Kamara got hurt this year, guys like that second contract, 26, 27, 28 year old running backs are guys I'm staying away from in the startup. Now, if I go into year two and I say, listen, I want to compete now. Sure. I'll trade for these guys when they're much cheaper than their startup cost. In terms of the actual startup, I'm building around quarterbacks and wide receivers because A, they bring the longest shelf life of production, and B, they're going to hold their value the longest. In my opinion, running back depth only really matters once you're ready to push your chips in the middle. Again, you mentioned some of the names earlier. Players such as James Conner, Melvin Gordon, Jamal Williams, Cordell Patterson were players at some point this year that contending teams could have had for second or third round rookie picks that would complement an already elite roster based on, you know, your Jeffersons, your AJ Browns, your Justin Herbert, your Joe Burrows. Those teams that were built the right way with ample quarterback and wide receiver depth can acquire these cheap older running backs when they want to make their push for, again, second, third round rookie picks, which isn't going to completely hamper your future. Whereas, again, if you, if you, invest in a Dalvin Cook. If you took him in the first round of your startup last year and now he's going in the fourth round, you're not so pleased with that investment. Right. And I think, again, I, I thought of a real life example to kind of paint this picture. It'd be like if, if I gave you $20 million right now and said, you know, build some generational wealth for your family and for yourself, what would you buy first? Would you buy real estate or would you buy cars? Because I'm running backs are that. cars, right? Like they are depreciating assets. So your real estate investments are your your franchise quarterbacks for your dynasty roster. They are your Justin Jefferson's, your Jamar Chase's. Those are the type of guys that you want to be investing in and then pushing your chips to the middle with your running backs, either in your rookie drafts, when you draft these rookie running backs on rookie contracts, that's usually the best time to acquire running backs for a competing team. Or if you want to trade low on these RB2 types that Danny already mentioned, that is the best way to do it. Like you said, if you can build your team based on around a foundation of quarterbacks and wide receivers. And again, we are talking about super flex leagues uh, traditionally. So quarterbacks are a very important position. Obviously, if you have, you know, a Kyle Pitts, a Mark Andrews, a foundational tight end that also applies as well. Yeah, no, again, uh, it's simple, really. Base your team around value, acquire positional need once you're ready to make that push. And let's be honest here. Quarterbacks and wide receivers are always going to have more inherent value than running backs in the long term. Yep, exactly. So I'm going to get into the final tip and then we'll head out of here. Tip number six, 
And we could probably make an entire separate video on trading, but I'm just going to kind of wrap it up in this video. Don't try to win trades. Now, number one, I think we can fall victim to this sometimes. I know Danny specifically does fall victim to this sometimes. Your yeah. trade has to benefit the other team as well, or else that manager may not want to trade with you in the future, whatever the case is. If you're trade happy, and we both love trading, right? Uh, I love trading. You love trading. You've made like five trades since the season has been over. Yeah. Don't send trades like a second rounder for Justin Herbert in uh, you know, a super flex league because that opposing manager is not going to want to trade with you in the future if you do something like that. Picture this as the real life NFL and the Jacksonville Jaguars call up the Kansas City Chiefs and we're like, we're going to give you Trevor Lawrence or Patrick Mahomes. How fast is Brett Veach hanging the phone up, right? Like, yeah, within an don't instant. make trades where the other manager is unlikely to accept it because it does not benefit their team because it needs to benefit both parties in order for it to be a good trade, number one. And number two, and it needs to be a good trade for those two teams to do business in the future together. And also the other part of this is if you lose a trade, quote unquote, let's say the value doesn't really align, but it makes your team better. It makes your team advance towards competing. Let's say you're a rebuilding team and you're not getting the value you would like for a guy like DJ Moore. Let's say you think he's worth two first round picks and somebody's offering you a first and a second or a first and a young piece or something like that. Uh, and maybe a better example is like Stefan Diggs. Maybe you want yeah, first Hawkins, Stephon Diggs. Someone willing is willing to give you a, uh, the 110 and, you know, um, Amon, Ra. Amon Ross St. Brown, right? And you don't want to give them up for that cheap, let's say. But if that team, if your team is not ready to compete, you have to tear it down and rebuild. That advances your team forward. So maybe you lost that trade from a value perspective. You put it into a trade calculator and it says you're getting ripped off. That doesn't matter because your team is being advanced into the competitive window that you're looking towards. So maybe you're looking towards 2022, 2023, 2024. As long as your trades that you're making are, are serving that purpose, they're serving the point that you want to compete in a couple of years from now, that is the easiest way that you can, quote, win the trade by losing the trade. Yeah, and I, I'm, I'm actually glad you mentioned that because a similar example is actually a trade I made this week. So uh, for instance, for rationale, for context here, uh, I dealt with Garrett if you're Garrett if you're watching the shout out, but Garrett is the defending champion in our dynasty league, and I'm in a tank mode. I have a bunch of rookie picks uh, this year and next year, and basically from my perspective, as much as I love Javante Williams, I don't need his running back production right now. And again, I think he's a great asset to hold, and it was tough put uh, a parting with him. But the deal I made, I, I'll, I'll throw it on the screen. But I basically sent away Joe Burrow, Javante Williams, and what is the two twelve. For Justin Herbert, a 2023 first round pick and a Monarch St. Brown. My rationale here is that Justin Herbert for me is a, a decent little upgrade over Joe Burrow given his age, given his rushing upside there. So I do value Herbert more in the long run. Getting off of Javante Williams gets me more value in terms of maybe tanking my pick in 2023 to maybe get the 101, maybe get a Bijan Robinson. Because at the end of the day here, I have no running backs on this team. I'm planning to build them next year. And then I also acquire another 2023 first round pick to build my wealth and keep getting these liquid assets in, uh, in my team. So, although again, the majority on Twitter said, I think it was a 60 to 40% split between favoring his side. Both parties are happy in that scenario because he gets more players that can help him go back to back and win. Now I get to further my assets, get another 2023 pick and upgrade in my opinion, the quarterback position. Yeah. And that's what it's all about too. And I think that again, is a good example of a mutually beneficial trade for a guy that maybe takes a bit of a downgrade at quarterback. He gets a young win now type of running back that he can use to compete next year. And that's basically what I was talking about. So again, we're all on the same page here. Don't try and win trades. Don't try and fleece the opposing owner. You don't want to put on Twitter and be like, oh, look how you know hard I just destroyed this guy in this trade. Because if he sees that, he doesn't want to trade with you anymore. And then you just burnt a bridge. It's the same exactly. in the real NFL as Brett Feach getting called by the Jacksonville Jaguars general manager and saying, we'll give you Trevor Lawrence or Patrick Mahomes. He's gonna be like, I'm not fucking dealing with that guy anymore because this guy doesn't know his ass from the hole in the Delusional. ground. Like, There's no way I would ever make that trade in my life. So that's what you want to do. You want to form good relationships with your league mates when it comes to trading. Because if you're like us, you probably like trading and you probably like moving pieces and, and capitalizing on market discrepancies. And you can't do that if you try and win every single trade. Yeah, no, again, I 100% agree. Don't assume everybody in your league is, uh, you know, the Houston Texans. Assume that there are other competent managers that if they see uh, an absolute rip off a deal, they'll feel free to laugh in your face and say, yeah, buddy, get lost here. You're fucking delusional. Yeah, exactly. So if you guys did enjoy this video, again, it was all like macro game, a little bit of player analysis here and there, but 
This, these are the videos we love making. So if you guys like watching them, leave a comment down below, like the video. If you are new to the channel, hit the subscribe button as well. If you guys are curious about our dynasty rankings, they are coming very soon. We are uh, working on the back end, trying to get those ready for you uh, via Patreon. So if you want to become a Patreon, again, you can sign up patreon.com forward slash fantasy stock exchange. All the features have been updated. So if you guys uh, looked at our Patreon a couple months ago and you didn't really like the features, didn't think it was enough value for you, go and check now because the features are completely different. So uh, make sure you check that out. And uh, we will be bringing tons of content via our Patreon this off season when we typically had draft guides last year. So that's kind of the change up that we're going through. Yep, no, for sure. Uh, either way, Expect a whole lot of Dynasty content coming your way. We are excited to get down to business, roll up the sleeves, and grind this offseason for you. Whether you're a new viewer, whether you're an old viewer, whether you've been following the stock exchange since we first started in early 2020. But either way, appreciate all of you who are watching this video. Peace out. Enjoy your day.